Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started here shortly. All right, well, it looks like we're right at two o'clock on the nose, so I vote that we get this uh, show on the road. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Um, my name is Kristen Parker, and I'm the Director of Compliance at Risk Scout. I joined Risk Scout several months ago after spending almost my entire professional career in banking the last near decade of which was in compliance, specifically BSA. My last role was a BSA officer at a large community bank out of North Carolina that had a really unique and diverse footprint. A strategic decision at one point in my time with that financial institution led us into the high-risk banking space where I was charged with learning a wide variety of high-risk industries, including MSBs. I had a love-hate relationship with the concept of high-risk banking at the time. You know, after all, we were a really small BSA group and adding an additional burn it, burden of, of a high-risk industry honestly made me want to cry. However, much to my surprise, I found great passion for it and as I learned quickly that while it can be perceived as complicated to bank high-risk customers, there's also such great reward on many levels in doing so. You know, due to my passion and drive for expanding our ability to bank high risk industries at that same financial institution, I was able to build out one of the oldest Federal Reserve Bank approved hemp programs in the United States prior to any guidance or memos from FinCEN or regulators on how to do so. The adventure of building that program, as burdensome as it was at the time, was one of the best decisions I ever made as it led to me to realize that if you are a community bank and your community bank is asking or your community is asking for help you should really consider serving your community and higher risk markets are just generally underserved and much to their detriment and allowing them the chance to bank i believe helps really aid in safeguarding the safety and soundness of banks by keeping the really good players in and the bad players out. So coming from a BSA officer background, I know exactly what BSA officers and compliance personnel are going through and deal with on a daily basis. I've lived that life. I've learned from that life. And being a BSA officer, what in my opinion has to be one of the hardest jobs in banking out there in regards to the weight of responsibility that lays on your shoulders. I know there is an array of things that you're responsible for, no matter the institution size. And not only do your responsibilities come with the weight of the success of the bank on your shoulders, it also comes with personal liability. So to think or consider adding a new or another high risk business sector to your portfolio probably makes you want to cry or perhaps you're opposite of that. You're really excited of an opportunity to build a high risk program and look at it as an opportunity to give you something outside of your daily norms of BSA, you know, beneficial ownership or PPP loan fraud. Um, but really, regardless of what you're feeling internally, my hope is that through this webinar journey together, you can gather the necessary confidence and know how to go and knock a high risk program at your financial institution out of the park. So. On that note, let's get started. So let's start 
with a cautionary tale. The latest enforcement action news to drop from FinCEN on January 15th, just this past Friday, highlights the importance of what we are talking about today and the seriousness behind banking MSBs with proper controls and oversight. <clears throat> this $390 million enforcement action was filed against Capital One for failing to implement and maintain an effective AML program. Capital One also admitted that it willfully failed to file thousands of suspicious activity reports and negligently failed to file thousands of currency transaction reports with respect to a particular business unit known as a check cashing group. Now, the enforcement action details Capital One acquired other banks around 2008 that concluded in the establishment of the check cashing group as a business unit within their commercial bank. The, gr the group was comprised of between approximately 90 and 150 check cashers in the New York and New Jersey area. Capital One provided services to the check cashing group, inclu including providing armored card cash shipments and processing checks deposited by the check cashing group customers. During the course of the establishing of the check cashing group and banking these customers, Capital One was aware of several compliance and money laundering risks associated with banking this particular group, including warnings by regulators, criminal charges against some of their customers, and internal assessments that ranked the customers, these particular customers, in the top 100 of the bank's highest risks for money laundering. In this case, failure happened at many levels, internal control failures and lack of training on red flags for suspicious activity and dealing with this particular complex business type is really the, the failure on part of Capital One. Now, while this fine may seem large, it's actually less than about 1% of Capital One's asset size seems to me uh, that's pretty light compared to the crime in my own opinion. Honestly, I hope that they really make them go back and backfile all those SARS and, C SARS and CTRs as a, that to me feels like real punishment. Anyone who's ever had to file backfile CTRs in their lifetime knows exactly what I'm talking about. And it's, and it's likely that this, this enforcement action um, if you have an engaged executive management team, uh, you'll likely hear from them soon on this enforcement action development. They will likely want to know what you're doing, you know, to safeguard your own institution against these um, same type of troubles that Capital One got in, keeping you out of that same boat. So now that we've um, really gotten in here, let's start with the foundation of what an MSB is. Any person doing business, whether or not on a regular basis, as an organized business or concern, uh, in one of the following capacities. Um, in this case, as we go through this, you know, journey together, I want you to think about what I'm about to teach you as the base of a soup recipe. Any good soup recipe has a really good base. After the base is made, you may decide at some point later in the recipe that you want to add a little bit more salt, maybe a little bit more pepper, perhaps some hot sauce, you know, and that's totally fine. But regardless of what you add, the base must always remain the same. That's because the foundation of a perfect and often requested slash called upon soup recipe. So let's let's start with the foundation of your recipe. What exactly is an MSP? You can look on this slide and it gives you this, you know, overarching view of it, but it doesn't really, you know, go into the weeds of what a real MSP is because it's so much more complex than this simple definition that's before us. 
For example, currency dealers or exchangers, check casters and issuers of traveler's checks, money orders, <coughs> excuse me, or stored value cards don't always fall under the definition of an MSB. They are only considered MSBs if the total transaction activity is greater than $1,000 for a single person on a single day. But for example, a check casher can cash $999.99 checks all day long for an individual and not have to register with FinCEN as an MSB. But let's say they cash one check over $1,000 for a person or multiple checks that total over $1,000 for a single individual on a single day. At that point, they're technically operating as an MSB and are required to register as an MSB. That same threshold does not apply to money transmitters. Sorry. For example, currency uh, dealers or exchangers, you know, check cashers and issuers of traveler's checks and stored cards, you know, don't always fall in that de definition, but money transmitters and the U.S. Postal Service do. So uh, they have no threshold. So lastly, if we're highlighting how this definition laid out by FinCEN isn't as simple as it seems, let's talk about stored value cards. Because holy smokes, we could do a whole other webinar on stored value cards. There's a various caveats for stored value cards based on whether or not they're open or closed loop cards. And after this webinar, you're going to get a one pager handout on MSPs that helps better explain and break down stored value cards in the eyes of the MSP definition. So be on the lookout for that. So now that we've defined MSPs in the eyes of our banking god, FinCEN, let's talk about whether or not you're currently banking MSPs. I'm going to bet some of you are, are likely saying, no, we don't, we don't allow that, or you've probably got it written in your BSA policy that you don't. Um, but I've got some news for you. You probably are. I say this a lot with hemp. You say you're, you're not banking hemp, but you probably are, and you just don't know it. Same goes for MSBs. Now you're likely on the, oh no, now what do I do? I probably am, but how do I know state of thinking? Well, the good news is, is there's a couple of different approaches to identifying whether or not any of your current customers are MSBs. The first approach is keyword searches within your transaction history core. To me, I feel this is the easiest and most effective approach. If you have the capability, I advise running keyword searches in your system for words like Western Union, MoneyGram, RIA, Dolex. You might also set criteria in your keyword searches to occur for just businesses or DBAs to eliminate noise from also including personal accounts. Given there is no $1,000 transaction threshold per person per day for money transmitters, I take a serious look at each of these businesses and advise creating a game plan for addressing such transactions with those customers through either their account officer or relationship manager. Site visits are also advised, obviously when safe, to get a better understanding of the business operations to see if they are advertising money transmittal or check cashing services. Site visits are a real eye-opener for these types of discoveries and you don't have to necessarily tell them you're conducting a site visit. Just to pop into the store for a drink purchase is sometimes enough to tell you what you need to know. I once conducted a site visit to a store we suspected was conducting money transmittal services but the customer wouldn't admit to it only to discover they were also illegal slot machines in the back with a slew of people in there using them like it was no big deal. So again, site visits are highly encouraged. Another approach that is also highly recommended is training your alert monitoring staff to identify transactions that would fall into a category of an MSB. When I did that with the staff at the last financial institution I worked at, we discovered a numerous amount of businesses cashing checks over the MSB threshold that were not registered as an MSB 
which is an offense in violation and requires a SAR filing. Now, while there are different approaches to combing your current customer base to identify existing customers operating as MSBs, I highly, highly encourage each of you to take whatever approach you are capable of, especially if you've stated within your policy that you do not thank MSBs. It will go a long way in auditor and regular regulator eyes to prove you didn't or that you are actually trying to ensure you don't. I also encourage you doing this on a scheduled time frame, perhaps once or twice per year. As we all know, businesses change the trajectory of their operations often to meet the demands. So a business that not doing MSB activity today that didn't show on your current searches may very well start up tomorrow. So let's say hypothetically you've discovered you do have existing MSB customers from your MSB keyword search. What's next? This high level overview is a good place to start with assessing whether or not you want to keep those existing customers or open your doors to new customers. Steps include, you know, a risk assessment, defining your risk appetite, capacity and tolerance, building your risk management system and board of of director and regulator buy-in. All really important steps that are time consuming, but necessary to build proper controls for your high-risk banking program. Let's dive deeper into each of the steps listed in this slide. Now, when it comes to risk assessments, if you're anything like me, it's definitely not high on your list of favorite BSA tasks. However, we all know risk assessments are the necessary evil that provide an enormous amount of insight to the risks associated with our products, customers, location, and operations for our customer base. When it comes to banking high-risk customers, target-specific risk assessments are so important. In this case, a target risk assessment for MSBs aids in building a comprehensive understanding of the risks involved with banking a complex industry with so many varying and complicated risks and whether or not your current institution controls could support the compliance burden of banking such an industry. A comprehensive risk assessment includes the items you know, listed on this slide, assessing product, customer, geographic and operational risks might look a little different for each institution. But I encourage everyone completing a risk assessment to take an approach as if you decided to bank every sector of the industry. In this case, check cashers, money transmitters, currency exchangers, etc. So you have a comprehensive understanding of the industry and then you can work yourself backwards into what ultimately fits in your risk appetite, capacity and tolerance, which is also known as your risk governance. So let's talk a little bit about risk governance. Um, this, this concept applies to the principle of sound corporate governance to the identification, measurement, monitoring, reporting, and mitigation of risks to ensure risk-taking activities are in line with the bank's strategic objectives and risk appetite. The stronger your risk governance, usually, usually keyword, means more allowance to take on risk and the more comfortable your regulators are. When your regulators have confidence in your risk governance, they will generally, another keyword, be more supportive of you embarking on what may be seen as higher risk endeavors for your bank. Risk governance consists of risk appetite, risk capacity, and risk tolerance. All three help build the story of what risks your financial institution is willing to take, where the financial institution draws a line on risk and what risk the financial institution, institution can actually afford to take. Now, all of these can look very different from each financial institution. And in my opinion, they really should be defined alongside, if not by your board of directors and executive management team. A collective effort in this stage of building your MSB program will further ensure everyone is on the same page and understanding of risks and capacity of the program. 
A disconnected effort in this stage of your program build will cause nothing but trouble for you long term. Take it from me. For example, if you have a disconnect on your risk capacity and it comes time your program has grown and your talent needs additional resources, the fight can be much harder than if you had already agreed in the beginning on your VSA staffing resource capacity. Let's talk more about that on the next slide. When it comes to defining your risk capacity, appetite and tolerance considerations should include operational limits. Defining your operational limits should also be joint effort between VSA, executive management, and the board of directors. Leaving it up to just executive management to decide your limits can lead to a large disconnect between your realistic capacity and their perceived uh, capacity, meaning uh, true, not true understanding of what you know, you're able to do within your uh, staffing. Again, if someone has never sat in a BSA officer or similar role, it's hard for them to realistically understand how time consuming all the tasks involved in banking MSBs. A joint effort approach in defining your operational limits will likely be a good eye opener for your board of director and executive management, as well as uh, so they have a, you know, so they have an understanding of the compliance burden involved in diving into such a, a high risk banking program. I always recommend if this is a brand new program build for you to partner with another financial institution or banking partner that already has an existing program. So you can understand the average amount of time it takes to manage even one relationship. Taking that understanding and making something tangible and digestible for your board of directors an executive management team will help everyone collectively decide whether or not this endeavor is right from a staffing and expertise standpoint. And if you decide it is, how many customers you're able to onboard with current staffing and tools. And when your limit has been reached and you need either additional staffing tools or to shut down the program down from not onboarding any new customers. It's always great to consider a return on investment tool to help you aid in these conversations as well. A well-built you know, return on investment calculator can help you weigh pros and cons of expanding such a program from a staffing and tools perspective. Now your agreed upon metrics ultimately define when your bucket is full. There needs to be processes and procedures in place to communicate when you are approaching those limits to execute to, you know, to communicate up to executive management and the board of directors. A warning limits range should be set and next steps taken by decisioning parties should be based on the financial institution's current strategic plan. And whatever decision they do make, remember, it's not personal, it's strategic to their goals. So if they decide to cut your program in its tracks, then so be it. It's ultimately up to the board of directors and executive management teams to draw the line in the sand and make the strategic moves they feel are right for your bank, not yours. <laughs> so let's talk about a risk management system. A successful risk management system is achieved when policies are comprehensive and detailed and account for both what you will and will not tolerate. Processes are detailed and well thought out to achieve the objectives listed in the policies. Personnel are adequately trained on the policies and processes. Control systems are in place to ensure policies and processes are adequately adhered to. While the policies and processes may seem given since most BSA programs are built off of defined policies and procedures, the importance of personnel being adequately trained on these said policies and processes cannot be understated. And the buck doesn't stop with your BSA personnel being trained. Top to bottom needs to be trained. A good example would be your frontline staff, your new account staff. They need to be trained on how to identify and redirect inquiries for new MSP accounts to proper channels. However, your, your FI chooses to define that process. Lastly, but certainly not least, is the importance of a control system. 
let's talk more about that. Here are some examples of control systems as part of the third line of defense for your MSP program. Let me highlight some of these that really stick out for me. Operational limits. Operational limits is really expressing your capacity and metrics. It's basically how many of these can I onboard with the staffing I have now before I must add new staffing and or technology to help me maintain and grow this program. You have got to put this in writing at the beginning of your program build. Take it from me. It's a if you build it, they will come philosophy here. The MSB community, as is goes with a lot of the high risk communities, is much more connected than you think. And you won't have to do any advertising for your MSB program. And after you have onboarded one, the rest of the local MSB, MSB community will seek you out. You can trust me on that one. Spell it out and get buy-in from management and the board of directors on your capacity because if you don't speak up, the avalanche will come and you'll be stuck stretched and holding the program together without any additional resources. The second is authority, accountability, and responsibility. To me, when thinking of a high-risk banking program, this is comprised of who has the authority to approve an account, who has the authority to decline an account, and who has the authority to exit an existing customer. This needs to be clearly defined at program inception or your trouble is in your future. A best practice I like to encourage BSA folks to take it on is a collective group effort at onboarding to understand the customer, but clearly defined processes where BSA has ultimate authority to decline a new account. However, if a customer needs to be exited, a collective effort between the customer's account officer and BSA to ensure as little disruption for all parties involved is really highly encouraged. And lastly, exception handling, which is tracking of exceptions, including a reason, justification by person making exception, remediation of the escalated exception, high level reporting of track exceptions, and adjustments to policies and procedures if, if necessary due to reoccurring escalations of the same issue. Now let's talk about BSA specific controls. Onboarding, ongoing, and periodic reviews are the core of every strong BSA program, especially when it comes to high-risk banking programs. Clearly defined onboarding requirements is the first step in ensuring folks that you onboard are at least initially within your financial institutions defined risk tolerance. We'll dive more into that those best practices and slides to come. Now let's talk about ongoing monitoring. I'd like to scream it from the rooftops if I could about how ongoing monitoring is so important. What exactly is it though? It's continuous monitoring of your customer against adverse media as well as an automatic check-ins with your customers for validation of their current business plans and offerings, validating existing or new licensing requirements and required documentation collection. An example of required documentation collection for MSBs would be requiring transaction details for each money transmittal to assist in your periodic review. Both are very important, but let me express to you the importance of the adverse media piece of the puzzle. I sleep better at night with adverse media monitoring. I've been burned before by an MSB, and if I would have had adverse media monitoring, I would have learned of their arrest and criminal conduct long before I conducted their next periodic review. Burn me once and I will always, always be a promoter of adverse media monitoring from here on out. Lastly, let's touch on periodic reviews. We'll go more into more detail on an upcoming slide on the scope of what a periodic review should include, but let's go ahead and let me emphasize that periodic reviews are not optional when it comes to your high-risk banking program, and especially with your MSB banking program. They, they take a lot more oversight, in my opinion, um, on a more regular basis, but we'll, we'll get into that shortly. When building your onboarding process, you need to be as robust as possible in your application. You want your application to be designed to be as thorough as possible to help you filter out any unwanted MSBs. 
your application should be built based on your risk governance findings. The application should be thorough enough to aid in your KYB validation process. You should also require all MSBs to provide you with their AML policy, latest training documentation, and latest external audit. I think what gets lost in translation sometimes is that MSBs are held to the same BSA standard as financial institutions and an application they need to prove to you that they know the requirements under FinCEN rules and that they take their responsibility as a non-bank financial institution seriously. Part of your process build also needs to include site visit requirements. Will you require them? And if so, who will conduct them? Site visits are highly, highly encouraged to validate their application, making sure the business is operating as alluded to in their application and that the business actually exists. It is also recommended that a site visit happens two ways, a casual unannounced pop-in to just scope the place out and one where the prospect knows you're coming. It's amazing what people will hide when they know their banker is coming, but the importance of the formal visit can, cannot be understated as it is important for the customer to know you have set you have a set of expectations that they must adhere to. I always stated somewhere in my conversation with an MSB owner or operator, look, transparency is key here and I need you to help me defend why I gave you the green light to bank here. So when I ask for documentation or an explanation of activity, the expect expectation is that you'll respond to me quickly and remain transparent with me because I will always be transparent with you. And one other thing, site visits should be conducted by BSA staff. They really shouldn't be conducted by a party involved in getting credit for their banking relationship as sometimes folks will turn a blind eye for the sake of fulfilling their goals. Defining your account approval process is another ingredient in your MSP suit base. It must be clearly defined and agreed upon in your policy and procedures who has the ability to approve or decline an account. If it is the ultimate decision of the BSA officer to approve an account, which in my opinion it should be, then the BSA officer should be responsible for assigning that customer account officer to handle the day-to-day -day customer relationship if they do not already have them or have one assigned to them. You do not want blurred lines at all between BSA officer and account officer. You as a BSA officer do not want the MSB to become attached and start treating you as their banker. You need to have a shield in front of you for your own personal protection and remain as unbiased to a customer relationship as possible. It is the safest measure for you. Also part of the approval process and a really, really, really important part of it is deciding the customer reserve account requirements. All MSBs should be required to have a reserve account to account for returned items. Tip typical reserve amounts range from 10% to 20% of their average check cashing total for a month. If you have an existing MSB relationship now, and you don't have a reserve account for them, you really need to address this with your management team. Because let's say an MSB decides to exit your bank or you decide to exit a customer. There is a major risk to a late return to check. And if you don't have the necessary reserve account in place, you don't have anything to fall back on and your financial institution will take the loss. So please seriously consider this and especially nowadays because return checks and MSBs are on the rise just due to the state of the economy. A well-built onboarding process also involves educating all parties involved in the relationship on the ongoing relationship requirements. We touched on this briefly already, but setting expectations with your customer and account officer on the frequency of the touch points and communications you'll have with them for additional supporting documentation or account questions at the time of onboarding will lessen the friction of those requests when it comes time to execute them. Another item often forgotten is involving the branch that will be involved in handling the customer transactions and ensuring they have the capacity and understanding of what it takes to maintain the customer relationship. 
This often includes ordering bulk cash for the customer, taking large sums of cash from the customer, taking bulk check deposits, et cetera. Branches often get the short end of the stick with these relationships as they are very time consuming from a branch perspective to handle. Oftentimes to reduce the branch burden, MSBs are set up by the bank for cash delivery and pickup services via Loomis and Brinks. Let me be very clear about this process. If you have an MSB that is using these services, your financial institution is still responsible for filing CTRs for those transactions if they exceed the CTR reportable threshold. Take that lesson learned from me as I learned it really hard in the way when MSBs at the financial institution I worked at were set up with these services without my knowledge and a year's worth of CTRs had to be backed out for their transactions. And let me tell you, that is not a fun conversation to have with your management, not a fun conversation to have with your regulators, and definitely a burden on your compliance department for having to back all those CTRs. Lastly, well, maybe not always last, but last here is taking the step to internally risk rate your clients. This may look different for each financial institution based on your defined risk factors, but this step is really what launches you in understanding how often you should be reviewing these clients. So let's talk more about your periodic reviews. Periodic EDD reviews are, again, I'm stating it again, are non-negotiable for any high-risk banking program, but especially MSBs as they present so many different risks for illicit activity to your financial institution. The timing of your review should be based on your internal risk rating and your ability to monitor relationships in your transaction monitoring system. If your transaction monitoring system has the capability of peer group monitoring, such as Yellowhammer or I believe Verifin, uh, then you have you may have the ability to cut down on the frequency of manually touching these clients to review for suspicious activity. The peer groups allow for comparison to like businesses, and if a transaction is out of the norm, then it triggers an alert for review. Now, I have mixed feelings about this approach because not all MSBs are created equally, and activity sometimes can be seasonally based on their location. For example, a money transmitter based near a farm may see more activity in the summer than in the winter, while another one near a year-round factory may be active all year long. Another consideration is the lack of the ability for the transaction monitoring systems to review and really dissect an MSB's transaction conducted through Western Union, MoneyGram, and their inability to review for a concentration of checks cashed by the business. So with that said, an industry best practice is to conduct a periodic review every four months. That will give you a good look back of a whole quarter of activity, much less overwhelming than an entire year. And you'll be able to more regularly determine if that customer still fits in your risk tolerance or risk appetite. Along with periodic reviews, site visits should be considered at least annually to ensure activity is still commensurate with the stated nature of the business and operations at onboarding. I have bulleted some points in this slide of what you should be included in your review scope for each MSB. We won't go through all of them but one by one, but you should take a good look over this list and consider every one of them as part of your scope. Now, I've personally been through many, many audits and regulatory exams with an MSB program and have always been complicated or um, complimented rather on the robust nature of the onboarding and periodic EDD review processes as it painted a whole picture of the MSB relationship and made everyone feel confident, more comfortable that we had a sound and comprehensive program in place that was just, if not more robust than some of the big bank players in this same space, such as Chase and Bank of America. And those people had probably better technology in a room full of people just to handle their MSB portfolio. So what I'm trying to say is, if I can do it, then so can you. It's, it's, don't get lost in all of the words and all of the 
the weeds of it. It's it's definitely doable, and it is something that is very rewarding to do. Now, when you're doing your periodic reviews, you should be conducting a full scope review of the transactions for the review time frame, typically 90 days at a time in transactions, and they should include, based on the nature of the business, a review of a concentration of checks payable to any one person or business. Ensure that the cash withdrawal activity is in line with the amount of checks being cashed. Take into account the proximity of the checks being cashed to the location of the business. Uh, reviewing transaction logs for, for money transmittal services to look for a concentration of payments to an individual or business and transfers to high-risk regions. And you should also take into consider return check rates. That's, you know, looking at your return check rates is going to tell you whether your reserve count is sufficient or not, sufficient enough or needs to be bumped up. Um, these five review points will help aid in determining if any of the red flags exist on this page that include a wide variety of different suspicious activity. You know, I, th I think what happens with MSVs is sometimes is while they're trying to do the right thing, they don't know how to detect really suspicious activity. And, and that's, that is a downfall of banking MSVs, but, you know, providing them with educational pieces, um, looking through their training to make sure it's, it's within their scope, um, uh, to detect suspicious activity and report it is one way of helping you get a comfort level. So let's talk about exit plan and uh, how important they are to your whole program. Defined exit plans are also as important uh, as, as any part, other part of your program, really. It should be defined by the limit where you will not go, and that you know can look different for each financial institution. You really need to define who has the authority to execute the exit of a customer. Is it a high risk banking committee? Is it the chief risk officer? Is it a BSA officer? A best practice that has always worked for me is identifying the issue, communicating the issue to an account officer, taking a collective approach with the account officer on next steps and then obtaining approval on next steps or plans to exit from the ex executive management. That way, everybody on the same page, no one gets burnt or caught off guard. And if for some reason that customer wanted to cause an issue or stir the media pot, everyone knows the decision to exit that customer was the collective one. Now, a tiered approach is an option to consider when exiting. I do this many times with varying MSVs that were doing something outside of my comfort zone. For example, an MSV cashing a large volume of checks for a business. I addressed the issue with a customer who was very honest, someone say to a fault, who told me she was cashing checks for this business as he was employing individuals who were not authorized to work in the United States. Obviously an unacceptable business practice. So we exited her right away. Another similar situation with another MSB with a large concentration of checks payable to a business. The MSB explained the business he was cashing checks for couldn't find a bank because they would hold checks and he needed to pay his guys immediately on Fridays. For me to get a comfort level with that response, I had him request W-2s and 1099s from his business customer for the last tax year. And lo and behold, he did it. And his customer provided those returns and they added up to almost the exact amount of the checks he was cashing. I had given him 30 days to collect the information or we were going to exit him. He, he came through and we kept the relationship. So there are different approaches to this whole exit strategy, strategy as you can see. Sometimes you have triggering events that says, You've got to go right now, non-negotiable, and other times you may back off and, and just well, warn the customer, give them 30 days to correct it. Um, and if they correct it and it's continued correction maintains, backing off your, your exit plan. Now, let me be clear. 
about this one piece because this is hard for people to really grasp sometimes. Just because you've identified someone that has violated your program standards or has suspicious activity does not mean your program is broken. It means actually the exact opposite. It means your program is working and you've been able to identify a bad player and execute an exit plan to protect your bank. Now let's talk about board of director and regulator buy-in. Board of director buy-in can happen at any stage in the program build, but at, as a best practice, it's, it's best to discuss your risk assessment findings with the board to gain approval for moving forward with building the rest of the plan. I'd hate for anyone to waste your precious limited time building out a whole program when the risk assessment findings determine they couldn't stomach banking such an industry. That said, if they do give you the green light to go ahead with the program build, you must get their final sign off on approval on the entire build out program once it's completed. The board of directors have the ultimate responsibility in ensuring they have knowledgeable, they are knowledgeable of the bank's undertakings, including high risk programs and the responsibilities and burdens associated with the strategic decision to bank such customers. Their engagement in the program after launch is also a critical piece of it to the ultimate success of your program. They must be trained on regulatory requirements, must be provided reporting on the program on a periodic basis, that includes metrics, capacity, et cetera, and must continuously determine if this program still fits in the financial institution's risk profile, appetite, goals, and strategic objective. The last but certainly not least important part of your MSB soup based recipe is regulator buy-in. I always encourage institutions to include their regulators throughout their program build so they can share their own feedback and best practices for banking said high risk in industry. Most regulators don't bite. I can promise you that most of them want to be included in your program builds as they know they want to know what you're taking into consideration is all the necessary precautions and considerations for banking MSPs. The last thing you want to do is blindside your regulator with a brand new high risk program when they come in to examine you for the next time. So here's some key takeaways I'd like you to consider as we recap, recap what we've talked about today. You should identify any existing customers in your current database that may be operating as an MSB. A risk assessment is the first step in understanding the complexities of banking MSBs. Consider banking every type of MSB and work yourself backwards to what fits in your risk, appetite, and tolerance. Defining your risk tolerance, appetite, and capacity is non-negotiable. I've brought up capacity a lot today, so you know that it's from my lessons learned that if you're not vocal about your capacity, you're going to burn yourself out and potentially take on too much that could be to the detriment to the rest of your BSA program. It's okay to advocate for yourself. Staff training for each line of business is so important for a successful program. New account staff must be trained on identifying and redirecting requests for new MSB relationships through proper channels. A good practice is to build an MSB question or multiple into your account opening questions that will alert the new account employee if the answer is yes to any of these questions to redirect those inquiries for the new account to the proper channels. A strongly defined onboarding, ongoing monitoring, and periodic monitoring schedule is the core to a strong, robust, and sustainable MSB program. So while that concludes our MSB chat for today, our sponsor for this webinar today is Risk Out. And I'm not going to sit here and sales pitch you. Honestly, I wouldn't even know how to do that. Um, but I do want to point out that Risk Scout is comprised of folks with over 20 plus years of banking software technology experience and people like me who understand the burden and complexities of banking high risk programs from a BSA officer perspective. 
If you were totally lost during today's webinar, our expertise at Risk Out can help guide you through this complex process of building high risk banking programs from an in depth perspective. You know, our experience in banking combined with our years in banking software technology has allowed us to build a platform that provides an 80% BSA overhead cost reduction at a very affordable cost to financial institutions. Not only that, but everything for your high risk program is tracked in one place, making audit and exam prep streamlined and helps people like you and me stay organized and honestly sleep better at night. And the whole platform is designed to allow customers to apply virtually, essentially creating a virtual branch, which is really important these days, especially with COVID. So here's what I would like to consider your call to action. If you found this valuable, and I hope you did, consider joining our high-risk banking group in LinkedIn. It's a growing group of banking professionals engaged in discussing all things high-risk banking. You won't get sales spammed, I promise you that. We just genuinely want to help uh, be a helpful resource and discussion board for your questions and concerns for all things high-risk banking. So with that said, does anybody have any questions? All right. Well, thank you guys for today. And um, if you want to reach out to me directly, you guys are always welcome to. I'd love to connect with everybody on LinkedIn as well. Um, and I hope to see you in our little high-risk banking group. Hope you have a great day.